Hey everybody, how's it going today? Happy Friday. Hey Paul, how's it going? Nice. Is that, um, let's see. I know there's a federated wiki project I've looked at before. Is that uh, the smallest federated wiki, fed.wiki.org? Yeah, that'd be cool. It should be a really good fit for something like this. Well, have you been... Um Having any problems working with uh, any of the data APIs? What uh, what kind of roadblocks have you even run into uh, while working on the federated wiki? Yeah, totally. What about the uh, content security policies made it interesting? The fact that you could configure them? Oh, right, so you were able to um, embed from more origins, right? HTTP origins. Small side, we'll get started in about five minutes, give folks a little time to show up. I'm seeing seven folks on the stream, which is awesome. We had 20 
28 to 30 last week, so let's uh, hold our breath see if we can get up to that again. Yeah, that's what I figured. Glad that worked well for you. Tough to get right. At first we thought, you know, hey, it's a big chance to lock things down and make it so that uh, only um, sanctioned traffic gets through. And then over time we realized, ah, you know what, this is just <laughs> too much of a pain for people. So we'll maybe come back to really locked down browsing experiences in the future. But for now, I think developer ergonomics are a little more important because it's really developers who we want to make happy. For anybody curious, we're listening to the new Chromio album today, which I've been listening to on repeat all week. It's got some pretty good stuff in it. Right, since the existing federated content is on HTTP, you need to be able to get out to that. That makes sense. Yeah, you might get some utility out of the new global fetch API. I don't know if you saw that. We'll see. That's another experiment that we're trying out. If anybody's curious what I'm talking about with the global fetch API, let me throw a link into the uh, chat there. I think we probably have a delay of like uh, 15 seconds on the video, just so everybody knows. Hey Andrew, welcome to the stream again, glad to have you. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens with the public service announcement APIs. It's kind of interesting because I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to do some interesting things with um, configuring which services are used by applications and play more with those kinds of PSA APIs. That's what public service announcement, that's a PSA protocol that we're playing with. It's a way for services, web services, to describe themselves um, and say what kind of APIs they're exporting. And then we can hopefully make one service replaceable for another because we know what APIs are being exported by them. And I'd be spending a lot more time on that if it weren't for the fact that there's so much interesting work to be done in the purely peer-to-peer -peer stack. So every time I'm spending time working on the services tool set, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I'm not really sure if services need the most focus right now or not. And we actually are making some really interesting progress with the purely peer-to-peer -peer stack right now, especially with the DAT database coming along soon. So it's kind of like, eh, maybe we don't uh, need to focus too hard on services for the moment. Hey, Michael, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you. Let's see, all right, that's five after. Um, so uh, why don't we get this thing started? I'm gonna do a slideshow to get the stream going. It's probably be doing this every time. So uh, a little bit of background for anybody that's new. Beaker Browser is a uh, experimental peer-to-peer -peer web browser. Um, we have an open collective going. So if you like uh, the work that we're doing, we're supported almost entirely off of the open collective so donations are awesome we really appreciate all those contributions feel free to join in uh, and uh, become a contributor today we're going to be 
uh, doing something called self-mutating sites, um, which I'll explain a little bit in detail. Uh, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer browser that we're working with. That means that one browser is able to talk directly to another browser, and you're able to host websites and data sets without having to use a server at all. Um, and so that's revealed by this new protocol called DAT, which works a whole lot like HTTP, except that you can make it um, connect to other people's computers as opposed to, to, as opposed to having to connect to um, a server. And that works a little bit like BitTorrent in that you can have a lot of different people seeding the same site together. So if you visit a site, you can say, I'd like to seed this thing. It's almost like you're becoming one of the servers for it um, and keeping it online. Um, and we're able to create applications like the one that we're looking at here. This is Fritter. It's a Twitter clone that we made. Um, but the, uh, we're sort of in this ongoing process of developing out the peer-to-peer -peer application stack. I'm learning what it's like to build on a web that has um, these built-in peer-to-peer facilities. And so these live streams, I'm talking about the uh, different tools that we are either experimenting, experimenting with or have now um, and helping to familiarize folks with how they work. So here's some links. Speakerbrowser.com is where you can get the browser. Fritter.hashbase.io is where you can find that Twitter clone app if you're using Beaker. And then again, there's our open collective link. Uh, check it out if you want to help support us. We are uh, very happy to have every contrib uh, contributor we get. All right, so let's get this thing started. We're going to make a photo album today. Nice little photo album site. Pretty standard thing to do. Just a page with your pictures. Um, the site itself is like your photo album. So um, a lot of the times, whenever you're using existing web apps like Facebook, you're going to create a new photo album on Facebook. And now your URL of your photo album is like facebook.com slash photos slash some ID, something like that, right? Well, our little photo album is going to be a totally independent website. And so it's just going to be a photo album website that we're going to make. And we'll probably start out by doing this just purely with HTML, right? Um, but then uh, as we work on it a little bit, of course, nobody wants to have to edit HTML every time they add a photo to their photo album. That's not a good way for this sort of stuff to work. So the twist we're going to do on our photo album is we're going to make it self-mutating, which means that we're going to, rather than write HTML just to add the photo, we're going to put JavaScript inside the website that recognizes, hey, the person visiting this website is the person that owns the site. So let's give some controls for, for uh, adding and removing photos. Um, and because of the web APIs that Beaker adds to the web page, it's actually possible to read and write files of a site. Um, and so that's what we talk about when we say a self-mutating site. We're saying that the site is going to write to itself. Um, if you're not familiar with the term mutate, it means to just modify, basically. And so self-modifying, self-mutating. Um, just a little bit of um, sort of background ex explanation for um, this notion of owning a site. Every site on the DAT network, every peer-to-peer -peer site, um, has a cryptographic key pair. And uh, I don't probably won't get too deep into how that works, so look up uh, key pairs if you're not familiar with it. But uh, there's a private key and a public key. And the owner of a site has the private key. And to access the site, you um, go to the public key. So every DAT address is actually a public key. Um, and so even if you get the website's data from Alice, she can rehost it, no problem, but she can't modify it. Only I have the right capabilities for a site because I have the private key. And if you create your own site, you'll have the private key for it so then you can edit it. So owning the key is what makes you the owner of a site. All right, as usual for our stream, the apps that we're going to make, no servers, we're not going to use any NPM modules, and we're just going to use the DAT APIs. So we're staying as vanilla as possible, and we're going to follow our number one rule of doing things on the live stream, which is we're going to just always try to do the simplest thing as opposed to the most sophisticated or elegant thing. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time humming and hawing over the right choice. And those are those links again, which I'll bring back later. So let's dig into this. All right. So first things first, let's create a new website. Uh, let's use the template just to get things started a little faster. And we'll call this my self-mutating photo album. Give it a fab icon, picture makes sense. 
set a local directory so that it is syncing onto my file system. Good deal. I'll copy the path to that location and open it up in Sublime. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. I've been doing some work on the templates inside of Beaker, and it looks like I broke the uh, website. Oh, no, did I do that? Yeah, it looks like I broke the template. So, uh, that's my to-do list. So, template didn't work, so I'm going to have to manually create an index to this, you know. Feel free to let me know if I get some of my HTML wrong. We can never keep this stuff straight. Live coding for the win, let's do it. Unlike last week, I did not write this app ahead of time. So I'm gonna be flying by the seat of my pants. Gotta keep it exciting somehow, right? Okay, I got live reloading on as usual, which is always fun because that means I can just hit save and just like that, the page reloads. Love that, all right. So let's start with our styles. I've been working on a um, UI kit for projects like this. And I'm going to pull that in so that we can have a slightly nicer aesthetic. So uh, here's my UI kit site. Actually, I believe this is at, uh, at paulsuikit.hashbase.io. So that's what I'm going to use. Um, so, you know, just a couple of um, typography helpers, a couple of layout helpers like these sections some help with forms and things like that it's like my little miniature bootstrap so to use this i'm actually going to uh let's see i'm going to link to the style sheet href equals let's see i believe i've got an all that css i do And look at that, instantly beautiful. Let's test out my... Tara is asking, can I zoom in? I can definitely zoom in. Mm -hmm. All right, let's make this ordered and padded. Okay, so we got some styles in here. That's good. So step one, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, hand code the HTML for my photo album because that's always a good place to start, right? So that I kind of know what the UI structure is going to be like. Um, and it also lets us know what it would be like if we didn't have something to make this more convenient, like the JavaScript and self-mutation. So let's do photos container on this, and let's add our own style sheet. And then probably what I'm going to do is get rid of the padded on that, and I'm going to give this photos container a little padding on its own. Okay, so I'm probably going to want to use a grid. And I have not got the grid syntax memorized, so I'm probably going to have to uh, look that up. But first, why don't we get some photos into our uh, site? So I'm going to first create a folder, and we'll just call it the Photos folder. And then I'm going to import a couple of photos. Oh, just imported that whole folder. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do. Get out of here. All right, we got a couple of photos of us working on uh, Beaker, so uh, these probably are good to use, right? Hopefully they're not embarrassing or anything. 
Oh, that's a huge photo. Let's not use that. All right, couple a uh, couple of photos. Those are all good, right? So now we want to have um, those photos show up in here. It's pretty straightforward. Just get some image tags in there, right? Yes, comfy. That's probably supposed to be you. As always, if anybody has questions while I work, feel free to ask in the chat and I will stop what I'm doing to answer. I'll do my best to narrate what I'm doing. Alright, summer 2017. I'm already starting to think I need some JavaScript to help out. Who wants to have to manually type in pads? All right, so we got photos on the page. We got one photo. Where did the other two go? Austin, bleeding edge, web dash. Ah, gotta get that E. Okay, let's get some grid styles going. Display grid. Now let me think, where can I pull some grid styles from? I know. Use them inside of beakers. Perfect. Too wide. I think I just need to set a 100% width on it. Hmm, okay. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to see uh, Tara's CSS, so she's the one to blame if any of this doesn't work. Is that how this works? I get to play Tara? Alright, I think I just need to set a width on the images. Let's say max width of 25% of the viewpoint. Hmm. Oh, that's too small. Let's just say 400 pixels and just call it a day. Too big. Hmm. Well, I do not know how to use grid as well as easily as I thought I did. All right, time to cheat. I'm gonna jump over to Tara's photo album app because I know she had to tackle this before because it was the same app. Not that one. All right. I should use flex. Oh, I may just need to use. Display uh, flex, and then that's wait. Yeah. Well, I may just have to use flex because I cannot get these images to behave. in there suggesting CSS for me. Definitely should uh, check my grid usage prior to starting the stream. I thought that would be a little easier than this, but here we are. OK, 
Okay, okay, okay. We're getting somewhere, right? Hey, all right. <laughs> the repeat worked as we needed, so let's get this thing committed to um, let's get this thing committed to CSS before we refresh the page and lose it somehow. I've gotten to the point I don't have to look up Flexbox every time now, but grids. Those are still a little tricky. Sweet. All right. So that's a start. I think probably it'd be awesome if they were clickable. Well, let's not worry about that for now. So obviously, this isn't how we want things to work in the long run, right? We need some controls so that I don't have to manually write this HTML. So let's get into that. First, start by creating ourselves a JavaScript. And we'll load that at the bottom of the page. As Mike is saying, grid is not as user friendly as I wish it would be, but it does hammer a lot of nails. Can't disagree there. Let's see. Make sure our script is running. Good. So obviously what we want to do is dynamically load in these images. So we're going to create a template element for doing the actual rendering. And that's going to be a pretty simple template element, right? Just an image inside the template. And I believe that somebody's knocking on the door. Um, one second, let me uh, deal with that. about the delay there. So, how are we going to get this to be populated dynamically? It's pretty straightforward. We got all of our photos inside the photo directory. We just need to read all those files and, and render them using our template to the uh, page. Now, actually, it's kind of silly to be using a template so far because, you know, it's just an image. So for the moment, let's not bother with the template. I gotta say, that the way I said how I feel. Actually, I've got some nice utility functions that I'd like to use. So, let's not do that. Let's go to my code. Alright, so these are my utility functions that I got in my UI kit. I'm going to use them as well. And now the fun of the ES modules really comes out. Because I get to import these things directly from that URL. How cool is that? So, let's call this the image template. And let's do um, image spell template equals template. And then, how does that render function work? I believe it takes in, uh, it's just HTML. Okay, I actually don't need that template, so forget it. Forget the template, we're just going to do this directly. So we just need the image, the photos container. And I'm just going to real quick do a photos container dot append render, uh, and then we'll just do, let's do a P. Just to make sure that our code is working. There it goes. Easy. All right, just got a question. Is keeping all the photos on the same folder a good idea? How does the data content replication work? Will it be replicated as a big blob or smaller chunks? That is a good question. So, DAT does something called sparse replication, meaning that you do not have to download the entire data set of a DAT whenever you visit it, uh, much less for a single folder. 
So I could, for instance, get a listing of this folder or this folder without actually downloading the files. I could access the index.html without downloading any of the other files. You basically can download each piece when you ask for it. So the cost here will be that if I put all my photo, photos into one folder, then I'm going to have a, potentially a long listing. Could be hundreds or thousands of files in a single folder. But as far as, it, uh, as um, having to download them all, only if I actually choose to read them. So there shouldn't be any significant cost or trade-off to using this folder structure. I uh, don't want you, I want you. All right. So we got our photos container. We got a way to add to the photo container. It's pretty straightforward. So let's list the photos. Now first, we need to get an instance of the archive. So we can use the DAT Archive API, which is a way to read and write uh, files that are inside of DAT sites. Each DAT site is also called a DAT Archive. It's an archive of files. So I can just put this URL into a DAT Archive and the constructor, and now I'll have an interface for reading, excuse me, reading and writing the files. Now, um, I don't need to hard code the location like this. I can just use window.location to get that. And then I'm going to list the files inside of the photos directory. And this is going to get us a list of names. Let's take a look at what those names are. This is, let's be safe in the way you should always be safe, untrusted input. You should always escape it so that it's not going to render to your, uh, render HTML to your page. Okay, and we're getting the file names, right? Now let's go ahead and remove those other images that are hard-coded. So here we have our different image paths, and now we just want to replace those paths with the actual images. This is pretty easy, right? We just need to do image source. And it doesn't work. What did I get wrong? Oh, of course. These names are relative to the folder that they're pulled from. so. We actually need to get the URL. Yeah, that's not even flat this is far. In fact, why don't we? Yeah, right, this is good. There we go. Look at that. Dynamically loaded from the page. So now if I add a uh, another photo here. We should get automatically that photo added to the page. All right, dynamic loading is now done. Okay, way easier than having to write that individually. But we're not yet to self-mutating. We're at you know self-constructing, you might say. But how about mutations? For that, we need a way to add photos. So that's pretty straightforward. We need to add a button. Do, yeah, we can do this directly. So we'll let's add that button to the header here. That's pretty classy, am I right? So now we just need to add a click handler. And let's actually, real quick. Move all this into a render function. And let's grab a handle to this button. Add photo button. And we're going to add the handling of the click event. Add event listener to it. Listen for the Click event on click add photo. That takes in an event and we'll make this async because I'm sure we're going to be doing some async work there.
first thing we're going to do is stop whatever the default behavior would be. Should be nothing in the case of this button, but we'll go ahead and do that just to be safe. Uh, and now we need to ask the user for a photo. I may have to refer to Tara's code again because I'm just now remembering I can't recall the best way to pull in a photo. Right, right, right. All right. way to add a photo. Right. And then let's see. I probably want to handle the on right, so that's files. There we go. Right. Stealing that code. So I think we don't want a button in this case. We probably want to do this the same way that Terra did it previously. And that is a file input. That'll make life a little easier. So let's use that. style that so it looks a little better. Let's see how she did that. It looks like a button. That must just be styles on the input. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Interesting. Ah, that's a neat trick. Okay, so she's basically hidden, as far as I can tell. Yeah, using opacity zero, hidden the native controls. That's fun. Okay, we're definitely stealing that. Nice, I like that. Let's see, do I need to steal any, steal any of that? That's just normal button style, so we'll have to come up with something. This is the important part, and this is probably position relative, I'm guessing. Yep, all right. Yeah, this is good. All right, so we're going to... Nice little trick here. Basically, what Terra did is we want to have an input that looks like a button right here, but the normal file input on... Um, on uh, Chrome-based browsers looks like this, which is just no good, right? We want a button. We don't want to have this no files chosen thing because this isn't a we just want it to react to the click on the the, uh, the event so click on the element so we're going to take this right here and basically hide all the native controls and then style the label to look like a button 
So we'll take label four equals files, and we'll put. Oh no, actually, that's the input type equals file. And then for the label, we'll put some styles on here. Let's just put background red on there for the moment. And position relative so that the position absolute inside works correctly. So what we should see is just a red add photos. Yep. And if I click on it, it triggers the file selector, which is perfect. Now we just need to make that set of photos look nicer. Or that uh, button, rather. So we'll give it a white background. How about this doesn't have to be fancy? Get a border radius of two pixels. Padding, where are we at? Cool, and then we'll set the font size to a little bit smaller, get a border on it. Okay, starting to sort of look buttonish. Let's increase the border radius a little bit. And let's shrink that font a little bit more, and let's do a linear gradient on the background, starting at white up at 0%, and staying there to 10%, then going down to, let's do FA, FA, FA to 90%, and then E, and that should give this a sort of three-dimensional look. Yeah, let's enhance that a little bit more. Yeah, that's about right. That font size doesn't seem to be taking effect, so let's take a look at that. Yes, okay, that looks better to me. And then we'll give it more padding. Okay, doesn't have to be a work of art. Just needs to be good enough for this little project. I think we're there. Let's see. Cool. Now if I click that button, there you go. You know, that really needs a hover state. You can't go without the hover state. We'll do a pretty simple hover state. And just let's pause that music. Reverse this a little bit. Do it. And all right, that's like some old school skeuomorphic, you know, buttons. I think we should all go back to that. But you know, I don't get to, I don't get to control all that for the world, but. Oh, so we all just need to go back to the Windows 95 styles. All right. All right. Tell you what I'm not good at apparently is getting the cursor to stay as a pointer. Is that am I using the right name? Cursor pointer. No. Nope. I'm just gonna roll with oh wait a minute. Hmm. Not gonna worry about that. Let's get in some handling of whenever a photo is chosen, right? So I need to choose this and then I click it and then what happens? Right now, nothing. What we really need to do is first of all stop having this come up. What we really need to do is have my file uploading or file writing behaviors trigger at that point. So we don't want to listen to the click event because this is a files input. We actually want to listen to the change event. Um, change add photo. And I uh, don't need to prevent default, but this is the code that we want to steal here. So. Let's start by taking a look at the files that get added. The control basically gives you an array of files. And you can go through these files and 
uh, read their content using the file reader API, which we'll step through in a second, and then we'll be able to pull that data, write it to the data archive, and then we'll be pretty much on our way. Uh, so, what is already defined? Render has already been undefined. I've been defined earlier. Let's see. What's it said about? Render has already been to, oh, of course it has. I imported it right there. So let's just call it um, update page. And add photo button doesn't exist anymore. Let's fix that. Okay, now when I click this and I select that I should see there we go a file list and um, because of a quirk of electron it actually reveals the path we need to uh, at some point fix that because we're not supposed to be giving that information to web applications but we just need to use the file reader API on the files that come in that was just one file but you can actually select multiple and uh, it's filtered in such a way that you can only select images so there's that file list this time with three so, what we're going to do is iterate through these files. Let's look at this particular API. File Reader is a web platform API that can take in one of the files given by this event. And we're basically telling it, let's please read this as an array buffer, which is another native uh, web platform a tool. It's basically like similar to the Node.js buffer. It's just a collection of the bytes. And then we listen to the onload event. And when that is ready, we then create a path using the name of the file. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this orientation code because that's a little out of scope for us. I'm also going to, yeah, let's just go ahead and get rid of all that. Then we're going to I'm going to get rid of this and just write to the file directly. We don't need that anymore because that's old. And we don't need that anymore. All right. So this is actually really straightforward. We create a path using the file name, and then we just write the file using the result of the load. Now, archive isn't set yet. We need to get that. And we'll use the self. And we need to wait until they're all done and then re-render the page. Or we could just re-render the page on every load. Let's just re-render the page on every load. And believe it or not, this should do it. So we're reading in the data into a buffer. When that finishes, that buffer is put on reader.result. Interesting. I wonder if there's any problem with that. No, because it, well, I wonder if multiple files might actually end up appending uh, the wrong data because of the variable being captured by the closure, maybe changing its internal variables. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to try that. Anyway, so we'll um, construct a path and then write those bytes to the archive, and then we'll be able to update the page, and that'll be that, right? Here's our self-mutation all in that little function. So let's click Add Photo. Oh, wait, got to make sure we're on latest. Refresh should be. All right, moment of truth, uh, add current.jpg. Nothing. What happened? Well, this is why you should console.log whenever you're doing something. Let's, oh, that's not saved yet. There we go. Still didn't work. Let's see, can't write to the images. Did I call it images or did I call it, I call it photos? Let's fix that path. Hmm. 
Hmm. Huh, okay. Two interesting things just happened right in a row. First thing that happened was that update to page made copies of all the photos, because of course it did, right? Because we um, didn't clear out what was inside the photos. Um, so then we had duplicates of everything for just half a second, but then the whole page re reloaded. Why did that happen? Because live reloading is on. So we had written a file to the site, and so the live reloader triggered and refreshed the page. So we'll have to turn off live reloading. But first we need to fix this problem of uh, not clearing out the photos container. Okay, now, now, we should be ready to rock. There we go. This is now a nice self-mutating website with a photo album listing that is dynamically generated when the page loads. And if I share this with somebody, they'll be able to see all the photos that I've added, right? because we're writing just directly to the page. But we can't stop there, because this button is there right now for everybody, and that's not a great idea, because people need to, uh, people only need to be able to see this button if you can edit the page. So let's fix that real quick. First thing we need to do is probably set some kind of like hide class on it by default. That way, it won't show unless we know, unless we uh, remove that class. Okay, so this is what somebody will see normally. And then on the load time, it's actually pretty straightforward to do it here, so why don't we do it here? We'll get information about the site. Uh, all right, so get site info. Now, basically, we can't get the public, uh, private key of a site from an app. That's hidden away. But the browser can tell you if you got the uh, key. And it tells you that by saying, is owner is true inside the info. Now, why don't we log info so we can take a look at what that all includes. And so if that is true, then we can remove that hidden. Hide or hidden? Hide. We can remove hide. Now, I didn't show. Is it is owner true? Ah. There we go. So now the add photos button only shows up if you're the owner trying to mutate the site. Now we could go ahead if we wanted to and add more controls to modify any of these things, make it so you can right click and remove the, the photos and stuff like that. Um, but that's probably out of the scope of this project. Um, one last interesting sort of thing to show is uh, a feature that I'm working on that relates to this kind of pattern. So this self-mutating site pattern is pretty handy. It's, a, it's sort of a way to create an interface for authoring websites um, inside the website itself, in a way. Uh, so you can imagine a photo album is a really straightforward thing because we're just adding photos to the page. That makes a lot of sense. But you might also want to do something like um, an event page, right, for a meetup. And so what you could do is create a self-mutating site that has all of the HTML and all the styles it has some JavaScript for the owner to be able to fill in the details of it. So set the title and the description and the time and the date of the event and then have it render on the page, right? So it's kind of like a nice website building uh, tool set that's actually in the page. Um, and so to make that a nice repeatable pattern, what you want to do is give people the, the base self-mutating site to work with as a starting point and then um, let them copy it so that they can have a version of it th that they own. And there's really two parts of that that's kind of fun. The first is that um, if, they, if you make it so they copy all the code, um, then they're going to be able to open up the code and the styles and change it. So it's almost like uh, good old MySpace days. 
because if I were to copy this thing, I could say, you know what, my photo album, I really want to have, you know, I think a red background is right for this, right? So as somebody that creates my own version of this photo album, I could style it up, make it look um, exactly, oh wait, I forgot something, though. yeah. Make it look exactly the way that my photo album ought to look, right? But I'm still getting the benefit of that code. Of course, that's, that's awful. So that's advantage one, is that I'm able to customize off of that basic template. The other thing that's really cool about that pattern of giving people self-mutating uh, sites um, is that when they duplicate off the template and then create their own site, like my photo album here, uh, the person that um, is using it continues to own all the data, right? All of my photos, they're all on this website that I own myself. It's not attached to some Facebook app somewhere like you normally do or like um, Imager or uh, Instagram, these photos are all uh, on my own computer and I have total control over their existence off of this URL. So we're getting all the, the benefits that we're aiming for. So the kind of interesting thing I think to do next for us is to find a way to make the self-mutating uh, website pattern easy to, um, to use frequently, right? So that people can make uh, these templates and share them and then other people can really rapidly create uh, self-mutating sites like this photo album. So let me show what I'm working on for this. I'm gonna real quick delete all my uh, all my photos here. Actually, why don't we have some fun and do this off the API? Let's see, var self equals new dat archive window dot location self dot redeer photos and Okay, there, deleted all the photos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, if anybody wants to access this here, let me just stick the URL in the chat. Sorry about that, Alexander. Uh, there's the URL for this. Uh, yeah, feel free to just ask me next time. Um, okay, so here's, here's the thing that I'm, uh, here's the thing that I'm getting at. If you create a new site in Beaker right now, we're toying around with, if you press the new button, having this template chooser here. And we have these two built-in templates that you can uh, select from. And wouldn't it be cool if um, we could just make it so that users could add their own templates, like these self-mutating sites. So that's what I'm sort of working on here with, this is not at all done, so I'm gonna have to open up the dev tools for the browser. Yeah, let's. Uh, photo album, and the screenshot's not going to look like anything interesting. All right, so now I got the photo album in my templates. Now notice the URL 3BA4CB, okay? If I choose it as a template, hit new. Now we just have a total copy. And I can go to it and add photos to it. And now this is my own uh, photo album. Oh, interesting, that's still wrong. <laughs> um, and then I could just do that again, right? I could go over to my, temp my uh, new site button and click new photo album. And now I got a whole another album and I could put other photos in it. So that's a kind of an interesting pattern that I think we want to explore is this ability to make creating new websites really, really fast, and by using templates, not only can we give people better start points with their HTML and their CSS or whatever app they're building, but we can even have these self-mutating sites so that um, it's almost like you're getting a little miniature app. Um, and uh, so then I think you could probably start to share these templates and uh, give people a way to you know, create little um, websites that are content specific and, um, and uh, easy to use. So I think that pretty much covers everything I was going to show today. Um, I hope this was clear. 
and, uh, and interesting. So if we have any questions, open it up to that. I'm also happy to talk about anything that's going on in the community or the project, um, or answer just questions about how to use the APIs completely independently of what we were working on today. So we got the chat going on in the uh, stream. And uh, let's see. Alexander asks, if I referenced a JavaScript file from pphrasy uh, via dat URL file path, would it fork it or would it be like a module that I'd reuse? Um, I think you're talking about, let's take a look at this, the files of this photo album. So this is a copy of my uh, original template here. And we have these imports. And so each time, if you have any third-party imports like this, those third-party imports will remain third-party. Um, it's only the files inside of the actual archive, the data archive, that get copied whenever you use them as a template or whenever you just um, directly copy a site. So uh, yeah, these are kind of like an upstream dependency if you use them like this. And we're going to kind of play around with how we approach that and maybe um, we're talking about having a way of being able to mount third-party dependencies as local folders, and then you can pin versions and things like that. But for the moment, that's how that works. Uh, let's see. Alexander asks, will there be some kind of registry for those templates, or how do I find and share them? Uh, probably uh, we'll put together a site somewhere. If we, if we move forward with the templates, um, we'll probably put together a place where where people can find uh, templates, and of course anybody could set up their own registry somewhere. You know, it's just like a, hey, I made a website with a collection of templates that you can use, and um, then people could go to them and add them to their um, collection of templates. Alexander asks, is the DOM.js for your hash space, from your hash space, similar to the index.js you're viewing? You could import, could I import them in the same way? Uh, yes, any JavaScript that is hosted on a DAT can be imported from any other JavaScript on any other DAT. So technically, the whole DAT web of JavaScript is available. It's almost like uh, NPM and the web are mixed together. Um, of course, you may want to have better guarantees about the code not changing underneath your application than what this gives you, because this is really pulling off of the live version. Um, but for the moment, it's a fun thing to, to do. That's what I'm doing here. Christian asks, do we ever use workspaces in Beaker? Especially when you aren't needing NPM modules or build steps, seems like a huge time saver. Uh, Christian, are you talking about the workspaces um, that Beaker created or workspaces that um, are in another tool? Which, which tool are you talking about with the workspaces? Mike Mullen says, compare this more to a CDN than NPM. That's probably accurate. NPM gives you pretty good guarantee, you know, strong guarantees, very strong guarantees about you know the immutability of a published version, whereas the DAT web, technically we do actually. You could um, peg an individual version by doing um, a version uh, reference number at the end of it, but we, that's sort of a developing feature. We don't. Uh, it may change in the near future, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. Oh yeah, okay, so Christian is talking about the Chrome workspaces and DevTools so that whenever you modify uh, styles inside of your DevTools, it could write back to the file system. Um, I honestly haven't tried that inside of Beaker. You know, Beaker is a, a fork of Chrome, um, and some of the features fork over really cleanly and some of them not so much. I, don't, I do not know if the workspaces even work inside of Beaker, so I haven't tried them, couldn't tell you. I've never used them in uh, Chrome. So, like, I, I have no experience with them, but I bet that would be handy. So, I don't know, maybe we can figure it out. It'd be really cool to have it wire up with the uh, local folder because we sync with a folder. Right here is where I was syncing, and that's why I was able to use Sublime to work on the project because Beaker basically watches a folder for you and automatically publishes it to the DAT whenever that's set. So, it'd be great if you could open up the DevTools and write to the same, uh, uh, you know, files path, basically link those two tools together. But... That's probably down the road. Uh, 
uh, let's see, Alexander asked, could I reference the static version by not using your dom.js, but reference some kind of different, uh, different dat hash or path that pins it? So we do have, we have versioned URLs in the dat protocol, but it's, the dat internals are still evolving, um, and I know for a fact that the internal versioning design is going to have to change for at least two different reasons. One of them has to do with multi-writer, and another one of them has to do with some internal discussions we have about dealing with um, corruption events. So if you look inside this control right here, you can actually see the full history, and you can currently rewind that history. So I deleted all these fi files. Let's go back to before I deleted all those files. So now we're on V106, and they're still there, right? So currently, Beaker actually retains the history of, um, of uh, basically everything in a DAT whenever you're working on it. And so I can actually go back and see this plus 106 at the end is a revision peg. So even though if I go to the most recent version, I get rid of that plus 106 at the end of the URL, this will be gone. But in the historic version, it's still there, revision 106. The same is true for JavaScript. You could peg to both this long public key and then a specific version, and then you would have a pretty strong guarantee that, yeah, that, that code is not going to change out from under you. Um, that said, like I was saying before, these revision URLs, uh, that kind of peg version, still a developing spec, and so that's why we don't talk about it a whole lot, um, because I don't want to promise things and then have it change out from under people. Okay, let's see... See, Alexander saying if I pin a file version with that plus X technique, then I could use the data API to get a notification if the pin version is older than the newest available one, right? Yeah, you could actually write code that would basically, um, you'd have to scan the history probably and look for changes to that individual file. Uh, and uh, uh, then you could actually detect if a change has occurred. Uh, Dax, Dax, is that how you uh, say your name? Um, Sorry if I got that wrong, but you're asking how the JSON rendering is working. I'm guessing that was uh, your uh, code. It's working pretty pretty well. Check this out. You go to JSON on. Uh, it's not a very good example, but yeah, the JSON now gets uh, automatically rendered for you, which is real handy. I think that's probably a better example out there. Oh yeah, okay. I'll go to um, let's jump into my library. I've got some JSONs in here. A little ugly, but there it is, right? So that JSON rendering, definitely a handy feature. Are there any, or will there be, any mechanisms to change websites that doesn't involve forking? What are the options for non-developers? Um, so, um, Forking is a pretty technical term, and we use it when we talk about making a copy of the site. Um, but actually, we've been trying to change, move the language in the, the actual browser away from that. Now you, we just had this button here, make an editable copy, um, because that's all you're doing. You're just making a copy of the site that you can edit, right? Um, the so so uh, forking is a you know hundred dollar word for what's really a 50 cent action. And we're going to try to make it approachable to people. Now that said, making an editable copy is still, you know, if you're getting dumped into an interface like this, this is still relatively advanced. This is for people who want to work with files and HTML and things like that. And so we're kicking around ways to make it so that applications are able to, or, you know, web pages themselves are able to give the controls for the average user. And that's part of what we're kind of getting at here with the self-mutating photo album, is that I don't expect the average user to be able to do HTML, but if you give them a template for a self-mutating site like this, it can, that template can give you controls for editing itself right in the page. So as a user, I would be interacting with an interface like this, and then if I want to get into the JavaScript and the HTML, I can go over and view the files and start messing with the source directly, right? So we want to have both sort of uh, layers available, the, the kind of average end user layer and then the behind the scenes for the person who wants to tinker with the code.
So if anybody else has questions, I'll hang around for a little bit. Oh, Tara is asking, can I talk about the downsides of using the self-mutating site approach? Well, you know, there are none, right? It's awesome all the way across the board. All right, let me think. What are the downsides of self-mutating? Um, one downside um, is that, let's see, let me think, let me think, let me think. I guess the biggest downside is that you're combining the data with the presentation. Um, so in my photo album here, let's jump over to one with photos in it. So this photo album um, has inside of it the HTML for this page, the JavaScript for these controls, and then the actual photos. The actual photos are the data, whereas the HTML and the JavaScript are um, presentation. So all of this stuff is presentation and all this stuff is data. The self-mutating site pattern by nature is going to be putting those things together in a single site. Sometimes that's what you want. Uh, it's very convenient. Um, it's really cool to have um, these controls ship along with the data so that, again, it's so you can met, uh, edit it yourself. Um, but if, uh, if you wanted to have um, more flexibility about the presentation side of things, like let's say that I have a particular photo album application that I use, and it's got all the features I love, and that's what I want to use whenever I'm looking at people's photo albums. So if I navigate to the site and they've got their own custom presentation in here, you know, I have to use their application that they have, their presentation code. So detaching the data from the presentation is a benefit. Um, and so uh, that's probably the biggest trade-off here. Um, if we just had the photos, just had the data, then uh, any application could be the one interpreting it and it's totally unopinionated. Um, an example of that is uh, Fritter, actually. Let's see. I think it's fine for me to open up Fritter. So Fritter is our Twitter clone, and it completely separates presentation from data. So I have a, a profile dat, and that profile dat is a, a separate dat site from the separate dat archive from the Fritter dat archive. And if I uh, go to my profile, we can see that. So there's a uh, nice little cover page, but that's it. If I view the files, we'll find that it's really just a bunch of JSON and a few PNGs and things like that. Um, all my posts are just JSON files. All my upvotes are just JSON files. My profile data, just a JSON file. And then this index.html is just this really simple little cover page that doesn't actually provide the logic of Fritter. Um, and so, yeah, that separation is what um, the not using the uh, self-mutating pattern gets us, because then um, I can change my Fritter application, and everybody's profiles will, you know, work within my my own Fritter. And there you have it. Hey, there's Jim watching the live stream. Okay, next question. Uh, how many different Beaker APIs? Are there to use dat stuff in Beaker? I think there's dat archive. Maybe there's also WebDB or DatDB or HyperDB or other low-level things coming. If true, when to use what? Uh, so good question. Right now, there is the dat archive API. And that's a way to read and write the files of archives slash dat sites. Uh, if let's see. Um, WebDB is, a, is actually a high-level library that's entirely in user land, and that was something that we created in the fall to try to see how far we could get with the existing tools inside of Beaker. So WebDB is just a, a module um, that works on top of that archive. And that's going to probably stick around, but we had some... I've, that was an experiment, and it had we have sort of mixed feelings about the results. Certain parts of it are really great. I personally think WebDB is a little bit difficult for somebody to approach if they're not familiar with the technology, unfortunately. And I have some thoughts about why that might be, but 
basically I think what we need to do is um, let WebDB sit for a little bit and think a little bit more about what it's like for a new person to, uh, to experience these tools. The other thing that's going on is that we have other Beaker APIs showing up. Uh, one new Beaker API is the DAT Peers API, which lets, lets you send messages back and forth with other peers on the page, and that should be really interesting and fun. You could do things like a chat inside of that, um, or some internal stuff like um, sharing your personal profile URL, things like that. We also have a uh, new database tool coming in, and that's what uh, DATDB is. Uh, internally, DATDB is called HyperDB. Um, so that's a little confusing, but um, the API that Beaker will give you is called DATDB, but internally, um, we call that HyperDB. And that is actually uh, going to be a really interesting tool. DATDB is a key value store that is very similar to LevelDB. Um, and you can read and write key values, uh, and it is every DATDB has a DAT address, just like a website. So everything we've been doing with DAT Archive, it's actually really similar with DATDB. You, have the, you can give it a short name like this using DNS, um, but by default, every DATDB will have a URL that looks like this right here, you know, just a long 64-character uh, public key. And that means that the DATDBs are networked. Um, and on top of that, we're adding in something called multi-writer, and this actually answers a follow another question that somebody asked, um, which is, how do you collaborate? Um, I'm sorry, if I get your name mispronounced, Omayeli um, was asking, can you share ownership of a site or just data? Uh, can a key be shared, or you know, how do, how does that sort of collaboration work? And that's what multi-writer is all about, and that DB is is where we introduce that feature. Um, so you won't share the private key, but what you'll do is you'll give every user their own key pair and you can authorize other users to be able to write to the DATDB. So actually, DATDB not only is a key value store that's networked, you can add other people um, using their keys um, so that they can make changes to it. So then you can have lots of folks working together on the same data set. Um, and that uh, in the future version of uh, DAT, we will also have multi-writer in DAT archive as well, so that websites will be editable by multiple people. Um, so that is all to answer Alexander's question about the kind of tools that are available. Uh, DAT archive is the main tool. DATDB is the new database that's on the uh, coming up in the future, and then DAT peers is an uh, API for doing bidirectional messaging with other people on the page. And uh, we will be putting lots of documentation together for folks to, to get um, you know, familiar with these tools. Um, but it's all just been uh, developing over time. And you can definitely um, make use of DAT Archive as it is right now. So that's the one piece that's nicely documented and all there for you. Let's see. Alexander asks, regarding the fancy view source, is it possible to create a custom app to use as an alternative to the browser's built-in GitHub like File Explorer and Editor, or is some important stuff not exposed? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, probably most, most of what you need is exposed, maybe not everything. Um, the probably uh, biggest question is, well, I guess I would say I would have to see what happens if somebody tries it. But it should be possible to make some alternative source viewing interface. And in fact, there's um, an application that we built a while ago that's sitting dormant, but maybe needs to be revived at some point, which is basically an IDE for dad archives. Um, kind of looked like Sublime. And um, that runs entirely in user land. And so, um, we definitely want to make it possible for um, user land to be able to manage data archives on your behalf uh, and also um, read and write the, you know, the files of a data archive um, in various ways. And uh, probably just some questions remain about making it easy to use and um, handling the permissions around letting people man you know, add and remove archives to your library and things like that. Uh, here's a question. Can 
we build real-time games with Beaker, or is it better to use WebSockets instead? Hmm, I would probably not try to build real-time games yet. The Dapp Peers API for messaging other people on the site is coming along in the near future, but um, it's kind of a, a fast, short-term solution, the Stat Peers API. What we're doing is piggybacking on the existing connections that are being created for DAT so that you can send custom messages uh, to people who you're downloading and uploading the files of the website to. The uh, thing about that is that you don't get any, get any guarantee that you're going to connect to everybody that is currently on the site. Um, and so um, I'm not, I, I can't make any really strong guarantees about the reliability of the uh, connections. I think it's very possible that those connections will drop and then be recreated suddenly with no warning. Um, so with a you know, real-time game, you want to have connections that are pretty reliable and um, that you know can handle the throughput of you know, lots of actions occurring all at once. I have not done nearly the kind of benching required to say that I think that could work. And uh, based on what I know about how it's implemented internally, I wouldn't say it's reliable enough either. So that appears, yeah, it will be interesting. You could also, if you want to, like use multi-writer or a DAT archive to um, write the game events to these DATs. But that's really not, probably going to be a lot more data being written to the DATs than um, you would want to do. I mean, you'd be recording basically a game session uh, on disk and then sharing it over the network for somebody else to store it on disk. You're talking about a real-time game. You're generally having events happen really rapidly and then throwing away that data. This is why you use UDP whenever you make real-time games if you're not inside the browser because you actually just want the most recent data and everything else is kind of dis uninteresting. So using a, a network um, persistent data structure for games doesn't make a whole lot of sense if it's real-time. Uh, Alexander asked, what does it mean that DB is networked? I guess Dat Archive is not that. No, they're both networked. Um, I was making that distinction compared to like Level DB. Level DB is not networked by default. So Alexander asks, does that mean the Dat DB is more low level than Dat Archive, and the Dat Archive API could be rebuilt on top of Dat DB in Userland? Um, yes to both questions actually. Um, the new version of uh, a future version of Dat Archive is actually going to be rebuilt on top of DatDB. Um, and you should actually be able to do that inside of Userland if you were so inclined. But um, we will also continue to have Dat Archive as one of the existing APIs. So you won't need to do that in Userland. It'll be there for you. Why don't we... If there are any other questions, feel free to ask. I'll hang out a little bit longer. All right, so Alexander asks, for normal browsers, I was always wondering, 
If once more low-level primitives are exposed, couldn't old web APIs be rebuilt in user land, hosted somewhere, and fetched on demand and cached if websites use it? So, like, you're talking, like, um, using the ES6 modules, import whatever from whatever. The W3C would have some kind of ordained URLs for hosting these APIs, and... Uh, so if less and less, Alexander says, so if less and less pages use older features, a lot of code doesn't ever get downloaded because what, what that was the core. Yeah, so Alexander, you're basically talking about moving more and more of the web platform into user land um, and having um, applications load it uh, on demand. That's an idea that's come up actually quite a couple of times. I can think of one other time in particular where somebody was talking about something they called, I think, browser.exe. Uh, and they were talking about moving as much as possible into user land, especially, I believe that person was talking about like the rendering engine, HTML and CSS and stuff like that. And the, um, I, I think there may be a future where that occurs someday, especially I can imagine that once we get into the, um, like VR and AR become really dominant and we have to have this really rapid change of the uh, platform, I could imagine at some point somebody saying, you know what, we should just be dynamically loading the front end based on um, what user not just the front end, but the entire web platform based on what the user is doing. There's downsides though. The web, the user land of the web uh, always has to be sandboxed, which makes it perform way worse. Um, uh, and uh, like WebGL is a really good example of that. WebGL is almost like, I want to say always half as fast as using a native application. And that's because you have to do all these runtime checks to make sure that no bad um, activity is being done by the, the, the user land. So you get this performance trade-off, and from what I understand, nobody is very confident, even with like WebAssembly and any kind of existing APIs, nobody is super confident that you could move all of HTML and CSS into user land. Um, maybe you could get a few of the um, web APIs, um, but for what it's worth, uh, I mean, you know, like I, I'd say maybe, like it's a, it's a maybe. Um, maybe uh, what I could see also causing something like that to happen is that it takes so much work to create a web browser and like the Chromium code base if you try to compile that thing from scratch I haven't ever done it successfully because when I tried it <laughs> I ran out of time it takes forever and I believe that Google actually uses a server farm for their developers to do work on on because that's how long it takes to um, build the thing. It's an enormous code base. Um, and you have to kind of think eventually that can't continue. Um, and so I actually think there's the potential for disruption in the browser market. The potential, I don't know if it's true, but the potential for a, a project in the future that starts from a bare bones and tries to move everything into user land so that um, you don't have to have enormous corporations doing the development of the browser, but small teams, and then um, everything gets segmented in a way that's more manageable. But yeah, it would, that's, uh, that's really in the realm of speculation. Yeah, it's wild, right? The, uh, it's an, just an <laughs> unbelievably big and complex code base, and I have to dive into it every once in a while. You know, the only reason that Beaker is possible is because of Electron. Because Electron has made working with Chromium so much easier. Um, and uh, every once in a while, I need to dive into the Chromium code base and the Electron code base to do bug fixes and things like that. And um, the complexity is really pretty staggering. Alexander asks, is Servo more minimal? I'm trying to follow Yash working on Dat and Rust. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that it is. Uh, Servo, as far as I understand it, is actually um, not a complete browser. It's a lot of um, the pieces of a browser, and maybe with a little more work, it could become the browser that somebody uses day to day. I haven't used it in uh, six months or so, so I don't know where it's at now. But my understanding is that Servo is never designed to be uh, a usable browser. It's supposed to be a test ground for technology, and then uh, gradually Mozilla migrates the work they do in Servo into Firefox itself. Um, so by nature, Servo is probably going to be more minimal. Also, seeing a Servo was a complete from scratch, or nearly from scratch rewrite, I would imagine it's pretty clean. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you were looking to start a new project, maybe Servo would be a good place to start from.
honestly, that whole thing I was talking about, you know, of a new browser project that's super minimal, probably is less likely now because of Electron, um, because they're making it possible for things like Beaker to exist. We don't have any sort of motivation to make a new minimal project, new minimal web project work. So um, there's also just the basics of the market. I don't know if there's a outside of developers who want to do work like this. I don't know if there's a market for a minimal browser or not, especially because the end user doesn't feel that complexity too much. So yeah, I love the idea of a small team browser, and I think if somebody was you know had a budget and some research time, they could go out there and say, hey, we're doing this thing, and, you know, but there's no, um, I don't see it happening in the near future. I could see it maybe in 10 years. Alexander asks, if I know if there are any plans for an alternative to Electron, maybe on top of Mozilla's code, um, nothing that, uh, is concrete. I'm, sh I'm fairly certain that Mozilla has given it thought based on some of the conversations I've had with folks that work there, but um, I don't know if they have committed to anything. I'm certainly um, interested in, in watching what Mozilla does, especially with their new code base. Yeah, Alexander, let's talk about how, as an end user, he does feel the complexity based on how running more than one Electron app kills the machine. Thankfully, you only need one Electron app, right? <laughs> no, I agree. I, I, uh, I uh, other than Beaker, I don't run any Electron apps because I, I use a MacBook Air and not like, uh, it was a low-end MacBook Air, so I have like, can't be two gigs of RAM, maybe four. Not a lot, right? Um, so more than one Electron app is brutal. And, I'm, you know, that's what happens whenever you have more than one browser running at a time. Um, people are pretty constantly asking, is there ever going to be a future where Electron ships a shared runtime, which would um, make sense, right? It would make a lot of sense for Electron to ship a shared runtime, um, except, of course, the downside is that there's no version pegging, so um, it's a huge advantage whenever you're making an app like this to that the runtime doesn't change versions out from underneath you. Um, and if you're going to have a shared runtime, then you really need that thing to be staying up to date and your relationship gets pretty similar to the way it is with browsers now. Um, in fact, if you have a shared runtime, you're basically making another browser um, and you're just changing the, the web platform. And my opinion on this, actually, if I wasn't working on Beaker right now, I might be out there trying to make a uh, shared runtime for Electron apps because I think it's a good idea, except that I think that, personally, I think that the web platform ought to be moving into thick applications. Um, that's sort of the meta philosophy of Beaker is that client-side applications ought to be doing nearly everything. The business logic ought to be in there. User data management ought to be part of the browser and the web platform. And then... Um, you use services and, you know, what you might call super nodes, which is, you know, the cloud or a big beefy desktop you have at home or whatever, right? You use those things whenever you need more computation or some kind of specific network service. But most applications, in my opinion, ought to be running entirely inside of the, the browser. And that's the direction we're trying to push things with the DAT APIs and basically all of the web platform features that are inside of Beaker. And uh, it's a very opinionated take on what a thick application should be because we're saying not only do we need thick applications, but we want to use these peer-to-peer -peer APIs to do it. And I think that's actually pretty important because we want the networking facilities of the peer-to-peer -to, -peer, um, to make these thick applications uh, really compelling. If you just started to have thick applications, but you still rely on cloud-based thick services all the time, then there are some advantages. You're able to access the local file system, but there's still limits and so I think a nice balance is this peer-to-peer -peer version of the web, which has thick applications but is not using um, old uh, networking technology. That's my view on this anyway. Uh, 
Alexander asks if we have any plans to bring Secure Scuttlebutt to Beeper. Uh, no, not currently. We have decided to be very specific about which APIs and which protocols we bring into the browser. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, a lot of the features that Secure Scuttlebutt has um, and also a lot of the features that IPFS has are in the DAP protocol. So if we bring in additional protocols, we're bringing in all the added complexity and overhead of those additional protocols and um, I don't see that as an advantage. I think what will happen is that the browser would just become um, slow and more error prone um, and harder for users to understand. So our philosophy has been take a technology that does everything that um, the other technologies do um, and just make it work for all the use cases. Um, in fact, we're planning on exposing an append-only log structure, um, which internally all DAT archives, all any, basically, so <laughs> zooming out even more, DAT is basically a tool set for network data structures. And it's a very generic tool set. Internally, every DAT data structure is built on an append-only log which is the exact same mechanism that Secure Scuttlebutt uses. So a DAT archive is built on append-only logs, DAT DBs will be built on append-only logs, and you can build really just about any data structure on top of an append-only log. So what we're talking about doing is exposing that append-only log as its own API so that you can build custom data structures. Um, and once that's done, the only difference between DAT uh, from a, you know, there, will, there are subtle inner differences, but the really big difference between DAT and SSB once the log structure is exposed will be um, how um, the, the data is um, replicated between users. Um, because SSB uses a gossip protocol, um, whereas um, uh, DAT uses a um, DHT to look up the data and exchange it with people. And so um, Secure Scuttlebutt is able to use some of the application logic as a hint as to what data should be sent and can uh, make some of its connections a little more efficient as a result but we're looking at ways to get similar advantages inside of DAT, and that's actually one of the things that the DAT mounting uh, specification is looking into is a way to mount DATs onto other DATs so that you can multiplex all their data into one connection. But I'm probably talking pretty deep down into the innards now, so I don't know if anybody even knows uh, what I'm talking about, but that's, that's really where that's at. Alexander asks one more question on GitHub, especially bigger apps like an in-browser IDE often have some kind of uh, continuous integration running tests and things like that that are triggered by webhooks on git push and stuff. Would something like that be possible in the Beaker browser slash dat world to either connect to existing services or rebuild such services in Beaker's ecosystem? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, this is one of the reasons that I've been spending a little bit of time um, on um, service integration in general in the dat slash Beaker stack. Um, with something called PSA, the Public Services Announcement Protocol. It's a way to wire up uh, services based on what they, um, based on documents that describe what APIs they, they provide. So you could potentially have an application say, hey, give me a uh, service for doing continuous integration, and then the Beaker browser would keep a, a list of the continuous integration services the uh, user has and, and give that to the application. Uh, so you could use traditional HTTP services for that. We could also look into, um, once multi-writer lands, it might be possible to just, well, even without multi-writer, you could set up a service that's just a long-running long running process somewhere that watches for changes to a data archive and then runs the changes out of, runs the tests automatically when changes occur, similar to how the library reloading works inside the browser, because you can get notified immediately whenever a file changes um, inside of a data archive. Um, so then you could just set up a service that's sitting there and watching the dats and then runs the tests and then stores the results and you could actually put the results inside of a dat archive if you wanted to and then the entire thing is working off of dat. Um, and then the question is just where you're running the CI and you could do it inside of the browser I suppose if you had the um, CI tool set all working inside of userland but you'd have to keep a tab open for that. So having a long running node process in a server somewhere or on your desktop uh, or wherever would make a lot of sense. Um, so that's, you know, the answer is yes, you could definitely do continuous integration in this ecosystem. And it's just really a matter of all the tooling getting put in place. Uh, Alex is uh, asking for more about, um, it's a whip, that's right. Uh, 
more information about PSA, and if you take a look at this blog post, that's the most recent thing that I've put out about that. Uh, Beaker's documentation is still pretty sparse on that, and in fact, PSA is not yet landed in master, so... Um, in fact, I don't know yet whether or not any variation of PSA will make it into um, the 080 final, but we'll see. Uh, so while we're waiting for any more questions to come along, um, general feedback, has this been uh, interesting for folks, this uh, Q&A, the stuff we're talking about, and the uh, stream today? Also, um, if you have any specific things you'd like a future live stream to be about, uh, feel free to toss in some suggestions. I definitely want to hear y'all's feedback. Awesome, Alexander. Glad you're, uh, glad you're enjoying it. It's really pretty fun once you get started on all this. Like I'm, I'm just trading my time about which web platform API I want to try out next. I'm hoping that we can get all the basics solidified soon so that I can just um, start running more and more experiments. I think there's some really awesome possibilities with um, adding site configuration into the platform, which is such a mundane idea when you first hear it. But I think actually there's some really incredible potential because, um, all right, so like suppose you have a website, like for an application that you made, and uh, you want to let the user configure it. That's a nice idea, but actually writing the, the interfaces to have like, you know, choosing the background color, things like that. Uh, you know, let's say you had this whole palette of colors, the link color and the font used for usernames and the, what the background color is going to be and all these different kind of theme settings. You can build a settings page inside your app to do that, but it's a total pain. It would be really awesome if you could just declare a listing like inside a JSON file of all the configurable things inside your app, and the browser could give that interface as part of its tool set so that when somebody wants to configure an app, they could press a button in the browser and then configure it, right? And then the browser would expose those configured values um, for the web app to read and construct itself at load time. All right. Fun, interesting, right? That's a nice little utility. Where I think that gets really interesting is for code loading. Because what you could also do is have one of those configurable options be uh, a JavaScript module input where you could say, uh, I, I would like to have a list of any JavaScript the user would like injected on the page. And then at runtime, I'll look through that configured list and load those modules. And now you have basically user land plugins. And you could go even further and say these JavaScript modules need to follow a certain spec, like it needs to be a um, further post rendering module. And so then the user can add in any these plugins or modules that they want to use, and then you basically are loading in code dynamically as a sort of bi-directional exchange between the user and the application. The application saying, hey, give me any plugins you have for rendering content, and the user then choosing which ones they want to use. Um, and I think that could be a really compelling way to expand upon pluggable applications um, because then, uh, uh, it, as opposed to the way extensions work right now where you're just injecting into the page, this sort of configured plugin makes it possible for there to be two, an uh, exchange basically between um, the application saying, here's what I expect out of the module, and then the module can export an API and the application can consume that API and, and actually choose how the plugin gets used inside of itself. Um, so that's something that's like on my to-do list of, hey, when I get the time, I'm just going to throw that experimental API in and see what it's like. Alexander asks, I'm a little bit bound by my day-to-day -day work, uh, and I need to support users not in Beaker land. Is there a Beaker plugin to kind of add the APIs to normal browsers, maybe in a limited way, just to get people started, and maybe offer users or hint them towards Beaker if they want more? Uh, we are talking about getting some extensions going in the near future. I won't make any promises on that yet, but I did recently refactor Beaker so that there's a Beaker and then Beaker Core. So if you go into our GitHub, uh, uh, github.com slash Beaker Browser, you can actually find Beaker Core. And the reason I did that is to begin, begin to prepare us for possibly starting uh, extensions and have a shared code base between both the browser and those extensions. 
Um, and there is active work being done, especially by uh, Mozilla right now, to create uh, the sort of APIs necessary for something like um, the, the um, extensions we want to make. So the, actually, the, the limiting factor is just that the web extensions platform is not yet powerful enough to do the kind of stuff that we are doing here. The other thing we have to consider is um, how much need to go into the plugins. Um, we would like to have everything we do go into the plugins. And so if the plugins only make it possible for us to do a little bit of what Beaker does, then uh, we're kind of, that kind of becomes what the platform, what the Beaker DAT ecosystem is, right? Because if everybody can't have the same thing, then um, a lot of people are going to have a crippled version, and that could be a problem for us. So, you know, we'll see what the, what happens. Um, but for the moment, I, I kind of I have to say, like, you probably are stuck just with other Beaker browser users, which makes this a little bit in the experimental world still for everybody involved. And um, we see that as a challenge for us to make Beaker browser cool enough and interesting enough that we can start to actually have more regular users. Um, and so our whole, the challenge we've given ourselves is with the 080 final version, we want it to be something that actually regular users can sit down and have a lot of fun with and start to develop that community. All right, let's see. I did say Beaker Core. <laughs> Christian Johns asks the real questions. Uh, any, do we have any links to share on exciting developments with our cat? <laughs> How do we get through a whole photo stream, live stream about photos on the web and not see a single cat photo? I feel terrible. You really got me on that. Uh, um, as Tara's, Tara <laughs> is rightfully pointing out, she's a very bad cat. She woke me up at 6.30 in the morning today, uh, as she always does. Um, Alexander is saying the idea you, that uh, he has is to store contract data in DATS because the project um, he's working on lives in the Ethereum world. Uh, I mean, totally. Um, if you're, yeah, I don't have any really solid answers for you on that until the, the extensions will happen. So I would just kind of, my, my answer will probably be just, you know, um, keep an eye out for that because they will eventually come along. And uh, once that happens, then you can use the Ethereum extension as well, and then you can begin to mix and match like that. Yeah, how has the swarm been uh, working out for y'all? I haven't, uh, uh, you know, Alexander just pointed out that Ethereum uses something called the swarm. I haven't read up on the details of the swarm, which is kind of funny, actually, because it's, um, as far as I, uh, <laughs> as far as I uh, know, there are really four notable players in, in just the pure peer-to-peer -peer space right now. That, IPFS, Secure Scuttlebutt, and then technically the swarm, right? That's the... Uh, other most notable peer-to-peer -peer project. Maybe I'm forgetting something here. Uh, and I haven't even taken a look at how the swarm works. Alexander, do you work on Ethereum for your day job? Does the swarm, uh, does it use content hashes for its address or public keys? I would imagine uh, content hashes, similar to IPFS, because really if you're doing um, Ethereum, actually it's an interesting question whether or not static addressable content is more useful in Ethereum or um, mutable uh, public key addressed content like DAT does. Because uh, Ethereum has its own system for changes. Okay, that's cool. Uh, Alexander does work on 
if Ethereum in his day job to program smart contracts in Solidity. Uh, and um, yeah, so like, you know, there's trade-offs because like Ethereum has its own system of um, updating data, right? You can write updates to the contract to update pointers. So in a way, um, statically addressed content could be better because you get a really strong guarantee about what you're referencing whenever you write one of those links. Um, and uh, so then the question is just, is the cost of updating those uh, static references high enough that you still want to have free mutability in the file sharing layer? And um, as we cultivate the pinning, the, the version pinning inside of DAT, you will actually be able to get static addresses. So, um, you know, um, DAT may end up being a good choice for things like Ethereum. I, uh, Alexander, I don't know if you ever saw Node VMS. I don't know if it's, I ought to be sharing this or not, but this is a thing I threw together at one point to see if I could do a smart contract layer inside of, da inside of uh, DAT. Um, and uh, I don't have any current plans to pursue this yet, um, but there is a proof of concept for it. It's not as good as Ethereum on account of the fact that Ethereum has decentralized consensus. And um, if you really want to make sure that a contract is upheld, you want decentralized consensus, at least along the, the way of thinking that um, blockchains are designed to do. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I, thought, I thought you had it. I just wanted to make sure. It's really fun. It's just um, probably. Uh, Actually, I think we may end up seeing similar um, tools, but without any sort of RPC. Um, once once DATDB shows up with multi-rider, I think there could be some really fascinating designs of how um, to build a, something similar to a service, but using only DAT and basically having the contract listen to changes to DATDBs and then run the rules of the contract to make updates to their own data set. In fact, I have a, this is getting way down into uh, like multiple um, jumps into uh, the internals of what's going on, but having a, a concept for um, a forum that I want to try out where you have a dat DB at the center that maintains the canonical state, but every user makes their posts on their own dat DB. Um, and this, the sort of central forum dat DB is an index of all the data. And what I think would be really interesting is to uh, set it up so that there's a contract that rules um, that central database and uh, basically says what the ad admins are able to do, if they're allowed to, how their moderation is allowed to work, but what kind of actions they're allowed to take. And then I am really personally interested in the idea of um, making a, a democracy where uh, the DATDB has a built-in shelf life of, uh, let's say, you know, the, the central database has a shelf life of a year, or maybe less, maybe like uh, three months, let's say. At the end of three months, everybody has to vote on who is going to be the next person to run the central DATDB. And what's really cool is that because every user's data set is self-owned, they have their own da um, database, you can just replace the central database um, with all the indexes with a new one and have whoever wins the, the election be the one running it, and then you just import all the old data straight over, and there should be a total continuity. It should continue to work as before. It's just you've changed who runs the, uh, the index, um, and as a result, that changes who's the moderator. So it's like you're, you're voting on the executive control over the um, forum. And um, you could have a similar vote for controlling who has control over the code of both the contract and also like the interface. And so then you would have a separation of the legislature, that's the people that write the contract and write the, um, the interface, as well as the executive, and that's the people that runs the moderation um, of the central index. Um, I'm really interested in, in exploring uh, basically democratic um, governance forms on, uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer web, because I think that's, first of all, a good idea. Uh, because I think we ought to have that level of accountability on um, online um, information spaces. Uh, but it's also something that's never been actually possible because the built-in 
authority structure of the HTTP-based web um, means there's no such ability to change out the leadership without losing the data set. But with peer-to-peer -peer web, we should be able to change out the, the leadership and keep the data and just import the data from one to another. And I think that's a really cool idea. So uh, Alexander says, you mentioned how PSA, mentioned PSA and how continuous integration could work in Beaker. Does that mean something like Node VMS could also work inside of Beaker? Uh, so like, it depends on how much, uh, depends on what you're looking for. What I would like to see is the um, tool set of the browser become as powerful or capable of doing everything that the tool set outside of the browser does. So um, if you have some kind of, uh, like Node VMS requires a long running process, like a service, to actually administer the, the contract and keep it running. What I would love to see is for the browser to be able to run those services, uh, or you could send the contract over to a cloud server or a computer that's just on your local area network and have it run there. So that basically, we have a universal container system for running services, and you only need to choose the location of where the contract or the service code is going to run. Um, and then you just have total portability um, for your code, and you just need to decide, you know, managing where it gets run, which is honestly not that crazy of an idea. You know, if you weren't able to do such a thing on a desktop operating system, you'd be shocked. Um, so that level of portability is just something that the browser has, the web platform has never had. I don't know if portability is the right word, but the ability to, to behave more or less as an execution environment. Um, and it'd be great because you'd be able to then, you know, run a service locally if you want it to be private or you need to do development on it. And then when you're ready to deploy it or use it for more people, you can just go and run it on your cloud host or on your work, your office's uh, local area network host. Um, so that is actually what I would like to see for something like this. Yeah, Alexander is pointing out that if you have the execution environment in the browser, then uh, the browser itself could audit uh, these contracts and uh, catch them out on a violation of the contract. And yeah, that's a big part of the idea. If you're using a crypto contract um, premise, then the more auditors there are, the better uh, things will go because then you can catch them out on a lie. Um, and if uh, it's hard to set up an auditor, then it's unlikely that one will ever happen. Um, so uh, I think it would be pretty great for the tools for that to be built into the browser. It's really interesting how close you can get to what the blockchains do without having to use proof of work. And uh, yeah, it's a total downside that you have to use a host because if the host breaks the contract, it's done. The whole contract grinds to a halt. Uh, but I think the way you deal with that is just by having um, mechanisms in place for switching out the host. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of the halfway point between the magic of the blockchain versus the current situation. Um, you can get the transparency and the auditability that blockchains are designed to give you, but none of the automatic... Um, magical, you know, mesh hosting that the blockchain gives. Uh, I would be 100% behind using uh, the blockchain solutions like Ethereum if I uh, felt confident that we were going to get away from proof of work. But proof of stake still remains a little bit of a question mark, and uh, I'm just not a fan of proof of work. Um, Alexander points out if the switching of the host is more or less instant, then who cares? And that's kind of what I'm, I'm where I'm at. Like I don't know what the cost of that would be. Uh, it definitely seems to be a pathway that ought to be explored more. And really, the I think it'll we'll explore this kind of stuff, this hosted uh, crypto contract concept will probably get its chance once the rest of the peer-to-peer -peer web stack is mature enough for it. Because uh, the reason it doesn't get any interest right now is that the blockchain proof-of-work decentralized consensus world uh, has money built into it, and so there's just so much more uh, value to be gained out of that right out of the uh, right out of the gate. You can make money off of it, no problem. Um, 
for us, I think we need to have a more mature ecosystem to actually get value out of it. But I think it'll happen. It just needs to, if everything else um, succeeds. So it's one of those things that's it's on the backlog because um, we have more pressing things that need to be uh, successful first. But what we're aiming for right now with 080 is to uh, just really set up a cool environment for making, um, not just for making websites, but I'm, I'm personally really energized by the whole um, template idea um, because I think the ability to make these sort of uh, one-off sites, these sort of miniature applications that are self-mutating is pretty a, a pretty big opportunity because there's a lot of things you can do with that, especially as we build out the stack more. So like once the DAT peers API is in there, then you can get bi-directional communication with the people who create the site and the people who visit the site. And so then I can easily start to imagine uh, things like an event page that can accept RSVPs, uh, photo albums that can have comments put on them, um, you know, polls and, uh, and um, also uh, collaboration tools for the office, so like an editable document that you can collaborate on. And so there's a class, I think, of these little miniature one-purpose uh, pages, perhaps they're all self-mutating, um, that we can start to really dig into and have uh, fun with. And um, not just have fun, but also start to get a little bit of utility. And that's what we're really zeroed into right now to try to get some uh, value out of the Beaker toolset, the data ecosystem in the near term. I'm glad to hear that, Alex. Um, I do think there is a, a, a certain level of simplicity that the halfway concept gives us that that I like. Alexander said, maybe you mentioned it earlier already, but there's probably not yet a place to go to publish and find people's templates and modules and things like that. Uh, you're right, that actually is on our mind too. It's one of the um, biggest missing pieces. There's no community spot to see what people are working on and a really natural choice for that would be to use Hashbase because not only does it provide the hosting but we could just you know cultivate um, lists of what people are doing, maybe have a registry or a portal that you can submit your site to. We've been a, a little bit unsure whether or not we want to do that on account of the fact that we've been trying not to um, create any form of lock-in to Hashbase. We want it to be what you call a fungible service, meaning that you could swap it out for another instance of Hashbase or another service that does the same thing and you don't lose anything if you switch it out, um, which pushes us towards making a sort of a background thing. Um, so we're trying to decide whether or not we think having Hashbase also become a portal is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, and I suppose if anybody has any thoughts about that, we'd love to hear it because this is uh, as much a decision or a feeling of the community as it is for us. But if we don't use Hashbase, we might actually start a portal website that's separate and uh, make that a place where you can submit things and discover content. And uh, since the stack is still being developed, it may just be a simple good old fashioned HTTP site um, where you can uh, um, use a form and submit your thing and then we review it and if we like it we stick it up there but we will uh, it's on our radar for sure it's uh, something that's got to happen soon Alex asks are there some sort of peer-to-peer -peer crawler yet and not yet no peer-to-peer -peer search engine anything like that would not be hard to do um, but actually I think you wouldn't find it worth it yet because there's just not enough content out there yet um, we're still in the Yahoo days of the peer-to-peer -peer web where you might as well just create a portal um, and then eventually we'll hit the level of saturation where you hit the Google days where you need to be automating the discovery and the crawling and the indexing of, um, and ranking of peer-to-peer -peer sites. But we're not, not there yet. So the amount of return you would get for the work of building a crawler, I mean, you know, it might be worth it. You give it a shot, but I'd probably be more inclined to just put together a portal, which is what we're talking about.
Alexander says, maybe then a good convention for make, marking something like modules or templates to make it easy for a standard-based peer-to-peer crawler to find them. I think you're talking about basically giving them types, right? Saying that this website is a template, and this website is a module, and so on and so forth, right? Because if you are, I do have thoughts. And if you're not, I could still talk about that anyway. I hope people are finding this interesting. There's still 14 folks on the channel, so or on the stream, so I'm just going to keep going as long as Alexander has questions. Yeah, so um, we don't have a package.json yet. Um, we have a dat.json is what we use. Um, similar idea. And uh, deciding what metadata should go in there is kind of an ongoing battle. You, uh, as with a lot of this stuff, it's kind of like you, you start using something and the next thing you know that becomes a long-term commitment. So you have to be kind of careful and picky about what you throw in there. Um, we have a type field that we put in at one point and then weren't really sure what the right way to use it uh, was going to be, and so that has kind of sat idle. But actually, a lot of the code for it is written. It's all there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I basically have just been waiting for the moment to put it to work again. And I, I think it actually could be a really um, useful feature to start to have types on your dat archives because then, uh, yeah, you could say like, oh, this is a template and then the browser could begin to, well, it's good for crawlers or portals or things like that because you can automatically categorize it. And then the, uh, the browser can also start to have actions that are type specific. So if it's a template site, it could have um, buttons in the UI somewhere saying, hey, you want to add this to your templates collection, right? Um, and then also in the, the Beaker Browser has a library, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how that should work, but I can easily imagine those types uh, affecting the categorization inside the library. So you want to say, here are your saved templates, and here are your saved code modules, and things like that. Um, so it's like, uh, yeah, we're thinking about it. It's just the, probably the hardest question, actually, is deciding um, what level of uh, trust uh, the type field has, if there's sort of any negative implications of letting a website change its own type or uh, modify another website's type if it's given right access to that site. Um, so, uh, yeah, still sorting that out. It's also kind of like, um, is it possible that the types will end up being a um, pain? Because, like, let's say you create a, a um, let's say you create a user profile type, uh, but that debt also ends up in containing within it uh, a photo album. And so now you kind of also want it to be categorized as a photo album and the user profile. And does that start to create sort of like, does the abstraction of the type start to leak a little bit? I don't know. Um, so I'm still chewing on that. Yeah, we do have metadata right now for, you know, the title and the description for what it's worth in the dat.json, but uh, yeah, there's, it's all a little bit too um, unstructured so far to give, uh, like, the kind of metadata that would make creating a crawler super easy. Um, and, uh, you know, coming up with semantic types is like a uh, gigantic ordeal especially when you don't have any sort of centralized control over what those types are and what those types mean, which you, you need it to be fairly freeform for the web. Um, is a package.json or module.json a type, or is the type more like an enum or string? That's, see, that's a good question too, right? Like, um, is the presence of a file an indicator of the type? It's almost like duct typing based on the file structure of a, of a archive. And that's totally a valid way to go at it. You just look at the file structure and say, okay, this thing has a profile.json and a um, post folder. Well, that's a fritter uh, site, right? And so you're kind of like classifying the site based on the attributes of the files and folders that are inside of it. Could be the right way to do it, you know?
yeah, Alexander says, so dat.json would have a type module or so, and based on that, you would know what kind of dat you're dealing with. Is that what you meant by types? Yes, that's what I was referring to. That's the thing that uh, we have been kicking around as an idea uh, in the past and have some code for, but, uh, and in that case, it's, it's basically a sh uh, an array of strings with strings identifying what the different types are, and it's, um, we're just trying to figure out the right way to go at that what the implication of a type is in the first place. If we don't really know what a type is going to do, then it's kind of um, feels unwise to, to buy in or, or dive into supporting it. So we, it's one of those things we just got to sit on and think a little bit about. But I might go ahead and bring it in for user profiles in the near future because I've got an experimental user profiles API that I'm planning on doing. Uh, does anybody have any requests for next week? Um, what you'd like to see? I could do some internal work on Beaker if I just had something that I'm working on. I could just do that and um, live stream it, or I could make another project. Christian Johns asks, maybe better for an issue or PR, but in terms of community development, have you considered or discussed adding a code of conduct to the Beaker repo? Uh, I am always interested to... Um, consider adding a code of conduct if people feel like we need one. Um, I don't think, it's definitely, uh, I can, <laughs> it's one of those things that uh, you can get hurt by if you're not paying attention. So um, if folks feel like we need to um, investigate a code of conduct in the near future, yeah, definitely please open up an issue and uh, we'll take it seriously. I'm happy to say so far, our community has been awesome. Um, and folks have been uh, um, nice and helpful, and it's one of the things that makes me uh, really proud and happy about this project, that the DAG community has just been uh, very warm and friendly and, and good folks. By the way, if anybody's in uh, San Francisco or feels like making a trip, at the beginning of August, the Internet Archive is doing a decentralized web summit, and we will be there showing off everything we got. We're actually really trying to get 080 final done by then. Who knows if we'll make it, but uh, we'd love to see you there. Alexander asks, if dat.json could have a type common.js or package.json, would that be would just slowly import browser-compatible NPM modules into the system? Yeah, maybe. I haven't really looked at, yet at how we could start to get the NPM ecosystem into our world other than just um, using it in the build tools. It's kind of a, that's a big topic and may not be something that we have to answer. That may be something that user land can answer. We'll see. I'm hoping that by the time that becomes a really salient question, the DAT technology and stack will be adopted enough that that isn't actually in our hands that other folks with um, that particular interest can can drive that kind of discussion. But I've just been using um, ES6 modules in CSS imports as well. I gotta say it's a blast um, just working on native uh, code. Actually, since we're just sitting around, why don't I show some of the fun I've been having with this. Um, in my uh, we saw a little bit of it because what I've been doing it with is like my um, UI kit. So um, let's get the code open. By the way, how sweet is that banner? I found some tool and I put that into my bash RC so that it shows every time I uh, load. I love that thing. All right, wait, is that the right path? Where did it open? Come on, Savon, what you doing to me? There we go. All right, so first CSS, just using these imports it's great, right? Like I'm, I'm just using straight up CSS, and I'm using these. Um, let's look in the alerts. I'm using these CSS variables. So if I change the color with the class, I just change the variable, and it updates here. 
Um, you can do these imports natively in CSS. All I need at this point is nesting inside of CSS and I will never need a transpiler for my CSS ever again. So that is awesome. I'm having such a good time with that. And then inside of the JavaScript, these, you know, these imports, it's great. Um, and the APIs are getting better and better uh, for just working with the native DOM APIs. So, um, yeah, except for P2P Webcat, uh, this community has been great. Uh, so let me show uh, also like the template element inside of um, the native A uh, DOM APIs has been really fun for me as well. And I've been playing around with sort of like, okay, I want to be able to author web pages. And traditionally, if I was ever doing that, I'd set up some kind of build system for a static site because nobody wants to have to work with HTML directly. There are too many things that you need to automate somehow, like the navigation, right? I've got all these different pages. And I don't want to have to put the navigation on every one of those pages HTML because, you know, what a nightmare. You're going to have to update that navigation every time you make a change. So I need a way to centralize that. And there's no sort of importing system inside of HTML. So what I've been doing is uh, basically writing code that automates that for us. So if I look at, uh, let's look at the typography section. This is um, just got a, what I want the content of this page to be is nothing but a bunch of these examples of the code and then a rendering of the code on down the page. And I want to just write HTML, but I want to automate this a little bit so I'm not manually working with this HTML and I'm not manually editing the nav. So here's what I've been able to find. There's a little bit of boilerplate, so like you got to set up the head and the body and the shell of it, but there's no navigation up here. There's also a footer on all these pages right down there, but that's not on the HTML. And then the content of it, I've got this container for all my examples and then just a bunch of templates. And then uh, I have this code run. Actually, I have two pieces of code run, the common code. And that renders my header and my footer. And it also does some decoration of the code blocks. If there's a code block in there, it cleans it up. And so there's that footer getting rendered. There's that navigation getting rendered. And then for the HTML examples, I just iterate all my templates and I render them one version on the left side, just the code, and then on the right side, the actual HTML of the, of the template. And I just append that to the page. And so I'm basically mixing in runtime code of JavaScript along with some you know, raw HTML that I'm um, authoring. And it's almost like I've got a build system that runs at runtime. And uh, I've messed with build systems plenty for making various static websites, and it's always been such a pain. And I've just been having so much fun just using the DOM APIs and rendering it all at load time. And um, there's probably a little bit of a performance loss. I imagine you have some flashes of unstyled content if you're the first, if you're loading it the first time. But it's probably not that bad. Uh, and so for projects like this, I just totally, I really enjoy it. Um, the level of complexity is relatively low, and uh, as a development experience, for these kinds of sites. It's been um, really fun. Uh, that's, that's, that's really a sort of a fortuitous um, interaction between the DAT ecosystem and what kind of tools Beaker is able to provide because it's got the, the authoring tools, all this, um, combined with the new features of the, of the web platform that are just landing right at the same time. ES6 modules, the template tag inside of the HTML, um, all the new CSS features. Um, and having done plenty of browser work, one other thing that I've, or, you know, like web work, because um, I've, I've worked at development agencies for my main job for a long time, it's really nice to be able to just target one browser <laughs> when I'm working on Beaker. I know that won't stay around for forever, but um, if it works in Beaker, it works for everybody whenever I'm making one of these things, and I do enjoy that. But that's not really an advantage of any of this right now. That's just... Nice for me as I'm doing this. No Christian votes for um, internal beaker development next time. You could definitely do that. Just take whatever I happen to be working on that week and stream as I do it. I've got a couple of archived live streams, I think, that show that too, if you're interested in looking at my page and finding it.
Okay, I guess I'm going to make a last call for questions and wrap it up. So um, give another five minutes or so. Actually, I'm going to go grab myself some water. And feel free to ask a question, and then we'll call today. Yeah, right. Runtime building, decorating the pages. It's great. It's uh, as a as the person making it, so easy. Well, while we're sitting, the one last thing I'm thinking about playing around with in the next two weeks or so is a user profile system. This is going to be probably a lab API, which means it'll be under the experimental tag, but it would be really great if an app could just say, hey, I want to sign into the user's profile, and the browser could give a selector from your profile dats, and you could pick one, and then the app could read it and also ask for write permission be a really uh, simple API. It's just another way to select an archive, really. But archives specifically that are designed to be user profiles. I think it might be a fun thing to try. This would be a lab API, because I do not know if it's the right way to go. But it would be, um, it would be handy for just creating apps that are meant to, to share uh, user data. Um, Example of that is with Fritter, you could easily build a crawler on Fritter, for Fritter, that indexes all the posts and makes a little search engine for searching your history. So you could make two apps. One app is Fritter, and the other one's your Fritter search. And it'd be a lot easier to do that if you could, uh, as the um, application developer, say, hey, just give me the user profile for Fritter, and then the user could choose it and do the indexing. But I don't know. We'll see. I'll give it a shot. When would be the internal beaker development? That would just be what I'd make the content of next week's um, stream. If I don't think of another sort of uh, user land project to do, then I'll just do uh, user land. Wait a minute. Actually, next week. i got to check my schedule. I may be out of town next week. Yeah, actually, I may be in San Francisco next weekend, so we may have to, maybe I'll do Thursday, or I might just have to skip. In fact, we may have a couple of weeks off in the next month or so, but we'll see. Paul Rodwell asks, user profiles based on the ideas on the GitHub wiki page. Uh, it would be similar. Um, it would be, I'm just going to give it a little thought and then throw it together. The stuff that I've tried in the past with user profiles has been um, very halting and um, because we've been trying to balance so many different things. And what I'm thinking with this lab API would just be a really minimal solution that handles the basics but doesn't get into managing data in any specific way. So it'll be similar to what's on the wiki page, but uh, maybe a little bit different. Uh, Alexander is plus one on the bookmark bar. Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll think about it. <laughs> I guess it wouldn't be too brutal to put that in. Okay, I'm going to give um, two more qu two more minutes for questions, and then we will wrap it up.
Well, that went two minutes, but I think I'm going to call it. As always, this has been really fun. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I will uh, let everybody know when the ne next one is going to be. We may skip next week, but if we do, then it'll be the week after. Uh, and uh, you can always reach out to me on Twitter, also on uh, GitHub Issues, so feel free to do that. And uh, thanks again. Everybody have a good weekend.